A warm welcome to the Respectful Net Theatre channel. Today is the 3rd of December 2021. Let me explain the project to you. This freelance project by Anuja Gosalka from India, Kai Tuchman and myself, Martina Lika from Germany, attempts to understand the role of theatre and performing during the conversion of human history into the supposedly post-human conditions of digital cultures. We do this in con conversations with experts from theatre and performance and scholars from the humanities or the technical sciences. On the other side, we explore also practically the per performative possibilities and regimes of digital environments. This becomes concrete within our digital stage on TikTok and our performative projects on Instagram. We will talk today about artificial intelligence, more specifically about performing AI. Let me just say hello to our guests for this topic today before introducing them more detailed later. So we have Heidrun Allard and Corinna Barth with us, both from computer science and with a background in the humanities. And the artists, Diana Sevanescu and Michael Streubig, both with a background in computer science. Artificial intelligence is an important topic because devices equipped with artificial intelligence, that is to say able for collecting data and processing them with algorithms, are building our cultures in a large sense, namely our conditions of life. These artificial intelligences define we, what we are by addressing us, what we know and understand by choosing and sorting data, they define how we communicate and how we organize society, economy and politics. This power makes that technical things and humans are today interdependently entangled. It is about a so-called techno-human agency or assemblage. It is obvious that it becomes essential to understand how AI functions with agencies, which agency they have or which we attach to them discursively and which agency and influence humans have. Therefore, our session on performing artificial intelligence asks for the operative performances of artificial intelligence and how these perform humans and vice versa, how humans make artificial intelligence perform and perform it. An important field to go more deeply and concretely into this topic of performing AI is firstly bias programming, as this field shows exemplarily the relation between artificial intelligence and humans. Bias programming deals with the prejudice prejudices humans put into algorithmic processing, which lead to discrimination and segregation. People claim therefore to intervene into these human faults and make other programming. At the same time, in this action, they are confronted with the unknow unknowable process of artificial intelligence as in so-called deep learning, for example, which are wanted in order to make AI stronger for organizing our life and finally, as in autonomous driving, our survival. We have to deal with the paradox of digital cultures that we use technology in order to understand it. The second domain of studying performing AI are the arts, as they are in a positive sense, playing around with artificial intelligence, looking for the options of resistance and interventions unfolding humans' agencies in the situation of being performed by AI and looking for other more equal models of artificial intelligence and techno-human agencies. We invited today artists, performers, and researchers who are specialists in dealing with these neg neg negotiations of performing AI and biases, more equal techno-human entanglements and artistic methods. So I will introduce more detailed our speakers and our persons to this to make a con conversation, a discussion. I will start with the artists. Diana Zebanesco has a double background in computer science and performing arts. She works on interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches to culture, society, and technology with a strong focus on feminist approaches to knowledge production. 
She is the research group lead of criticality of inter artificial intelligence at Weizenbaum Institute in Berlin, where she promotes a practice-led and participatory research on the topics of biases and expl explainability in relation to machine learning algorithms. She co-founded co Repli Replica, a performing arts platform inviting creatives and scientists to collaborate on imagining hybrid the behavioral models of humans and machines and to prototype future tools, cultures, and rituals. And we have Michael Streubig. He is a Berlin-based system theorist, artist, and play designer. He studied computation in German informatics at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg. He holds a practice-based PhD from School of Art, Design, and Architect Architecture at the University of Plymouth. He has been an associate lecturer at Leuphana University Lüneburg, lecturer in art, in, in game design and, uh, at the University of Plymouth and a lecturer, lecturer at Nanjing University of the Arts in China. Concerning our topic, he says that he aims to create playful artificial intelligence and imperfect virtual realities. As scholars, we welcome Corinna Barth. She's professor for gender technology and mobility at the Institute of Flight Guidance, Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany. She also teaches in the mechanical engineering department of the Australia University of Applied Sciences, Sciences in Wolfenbüttel, Wolfsburg, also Germany. She studied mathematics and political science at the Freie University of Berlin. Her research fields are gender studies in mechanical engineering and computer science, gender and techno science, degendering the technical artifacts, and feminist theory and epistemology. And we have Heidrun Allard. She's a full professor for media education and educational computer science at Kiel University, Germany. Her background is in educational science and computer science. Her research focuses on understanding creativity, design, and software development as a social, socio-material practice, algorithmization of that and datafication in education, and conceptualizing the educational modern, model of design as inquiry, understanding design as knowledge, knowledge production and not only as production of objects. Since 2016, she invites students of all disciplines to a summer school on artificial intelligence, offering a design and art-based approach to understand the social and cultural implications of AI, data analytics, and data infrastructures. I'm very happy to welcome you, to have you for our session today. We will start with the five-minute inputs of our guests on the topic, and then we will go for a deeper discussion. I propose that we start with Diana. Thank you so much, Martina. I'm very excited to, to be here and I'm very excited to uh, uh, present my ideas on the topic, which I find fascinating. It's also like one of my focus of uh, research and interest. Uh, my name is Diana Sherbanescu and uh, as Martina said, I have a double background as a computer scientist and also um, a performing artist. I come originally from Romania and I was educated in Romania uh, where I studied my computer science degree and then uh, in Berlin where I got my PhD uh, and in Scotland at the University of the West of Scotland where I gained my performance degree. And um, I'm very passionate about performative artificial intelligence and for me this passion is also motivated by uh, political aims. Um, I do believe uh, there are values in performing arts, especially like related to our embodied knowledge that could be beneficial uh, to be used also by artificial intelligence. Uh, there are a lot of uh, discourses regarding uh, um, politics of attention, politics of space, politics of interaction, uh, also self-reflective methodologies uh, with regards to, to construction of um, um, creative artifacts that could be also beneficial to discourses of artificial intelligence. 
Um, in relationship with performative artificial intelligence, I was looking uh, a bit at the definition of what does it mean to be performative. And I've discovered that uh, performative uh, is an aspect that has been embedded in the history of artificial intelligence from the very beginning. Uh, being a research leader at, um, of artificial intelligence um, group at Weizenbaum Institute, it's impossible not to, not to quote Weizenbaum and his um, first uh, chatbot, Eliza, which was modeled to be a psychotherapeut and had, which had this very performative uh, interaction with, with the user. And the origin of Eliza was that Weizenbaum wanted to showcase uh, as an experiment, as a play, also some psychological effects that interaction with those chatbots had on, on the users. And for him was astonishing that even normal, like uh, even people who had knowledge about what happens be behind the hood of Eliza, they were still getting fooled in this interaction to believe that they interact with actually uh, uh, living with a person, disclosing information about themselves. Um, then, of course, um, the, the, the big example of Kaspar, like playing against the blue, it's a very performative also scenario and setup. And uh, the psychological uh, who, who watches the documentary about this battle sees also the psychological engagement into the, into the game. And I think it's very, very interesting. Um, more coming to nowadays, I was looking uh, also based on the research that we did at the Weizenbaum Institute in performative artifacts such as Alexa, or AI toys for kids such as Cosmo and Vector. And I'm going to play just a little bit one of the videos here to show uh, some of the forms in which they are constructed. They are very emotional, uh, intelligent. Um, they, they have this performativity embedded in the sense that it fascinates. It's fascinating for the user to work with them. Uh, they are very playful. Um, we organized uh, together with um, a research fellow that we had at the Weizenbaum Institute, Stefania Drugo. Uh, we organized uh, playful workshops with kids, like to see how they interact uh, with, with those toys. And um, it was very interesting to watch. So important lessons from that. Artifacts, performative artifacts that, such as those um, are created in the uh, image of their um, designers, of their programmers. And I think it's very important uh, to know when we talk about uh, democratizing AI um, that we should include in the design and from the very early stages as many uh, people as possible so that their image, our image, um, it's, it's being um, also like introduced and implemented in technology. So um, this kind of opens get the gate to more critical approaches. Who designs these technologies? Uh, what is the space there for extending, expanding this performativity? What are the political implications of this? And um, my focus has been uh, for the last two years on feminist approaches to an AI design, especially like in relationship to embodiment, embodied knowledge, situated knowledge, imaginative, how to create technologies that are breaking the imaginaries uh, quite conventional imaginaries like promoted by the industry nowadays and how to make them more empowering. And when I'm talking about embodied intelligence, I think here theater and performance has a huge amount uh, of knowledge uh, about how to moderate um, uh, human interactions, like how to make harness this intelligence of the living body uh, through the senses, through perception, through listening, through training all through, through training all our embodied cognition, and not just uh, at the level of abstract uh, cognitive concept, but to use our full intelligence as human being to 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 interact with each other. And my question and my line of inquiry was how to use those techniques from theater in order to design to um, to design artificial intelligences which are more appealing to our senses as well which are not addressing all, only highly intellectual cognitive abilities but also could be sensorially self-explanatory um, and maybe uh, appealing to our intuition and of course like in the process of making those how can we actually demystify how can we actually make those technologies less opaque like while the, the technologies we have as Alexa or Cosmo or Vector can be highly performative, they're not self-disclosing uh, their modus operandi. They are not self-disclosing their intentions or like how they function, how they were built this way, how they were scripted this way. And I think here is the radical also power of performance making. Um, so 
yeah, theater is a field of knowledge as Augusto Boal and should be also a means of transforming society. Based on that, I started experimenting to it, forming replica as, um, as a collective, uh, as a laboratory for experimentation with theater techniques and new media, new media and technologies. And um, uh, this built into a bigger project, which was funded by Volkswagen in 2019, which was called The Shape of Things to Come. And we uh, extended we, this idea of theater as laboratory for interaction between human and non-human uh, agents with the idea of creating agents that are very much rooted in this kind of embodied knowledge of the, the human uh, moderated by performance. And we had to be very specific and we uh, wanted to focus on particular like uh, techniques. And we started with Grotowski from, um, uh, which is a Polish theater director who revolutionized the world of theater in the seventies. Uh, we invited experts from the Grotowski Institute and we conducted um, a series of experiments. We started with uh, design of uh, how to create an AI basically that is rooted in the, the practice led at the Grotowski Institute. Uh, we invited a lot of experts from different fields, and then we conducted uh, uh, workshops uh, moderated by uh, practitioners from the Grotowski Institute. And we basically like um, uh, took a lot of data. We gathered a lot of data that was meant to uh, inform AI rooted in the body, how to create AI that is playful, that is rooted in this post grotowski approach to theater. Um, and then a further project, uh, which I built on, on that, um, was actually creating such a, such a shape of thing to come, such an object, such an experimental uh, performative object. And this was uh, a wearable device, a wearable collar, who transforms the mov movement of the body uh, into, um, into a voice. Um, this was designed by Mika Satomi. And um, this was our first actually performative artificial intelligence that we defined. Uh, this would be worn by um, a dancer um, around the neck and uh, it captures through stretch sensors, like it's uh, totally like installed on the body, like it has an intelligence, uh, it has a microprocessor like on, on, on the collar and has also a speaker. Um, it collects data from movement of the body, like from those stretch sensors. And um, this way, the body of the performer becomes the puppeteer of this virtual voice, of this um, artificial voice that was uh, inspired by the first voice synthesizer called Voder, uh, created by Bell Labs, uh, which was basically separating the, the human operator from the machine. In our case, we had the machine directly installed on the body and they just, I'm gonna show just a little snippet of how that worked. We're not getting any hot for you. This yeah. is from the making of. So the idea with this is that we create an AI that also creates a feedback loop uh, with the performer that kind of becomes a partner, almost like a, a human partner, like in, in this kind of dialogue between human and machine and who can inform back um, the movement and the choreography. It's informed by the movement, but informs back the, the choreography. We went through different stages of experimentation uh, with uh, two performers, like with, uh, with kind of um, uh, experimented in different configurations, uh, with uh, creating almost like a choir of uh, different bodies. Um, And um, yeah, so, and in the end, like we also like use this as a support for the human voice. Um, so all this kind of in interact, this interactive device, this performative AI uh, was very much rooted in this kind of technique that we are uh, researching. And then we used it uh, in this kind of theater laboratory for experimenting, for creating performances or for creating creative content with it. Um, something this could be some yeah so something like this would look like when you have a choir of dancers uh, interacting also and responding to the artificial voice
Um, I think uh, I'm getting ready. I, I think I took more than five minutes. So uh, thank you so much for, for watching. This, this was just a glimpse into some of the experimentation that I'm doing at the moment. Uh, but uh, this was the idea to design a tool that is improvisational, that appeals also to the senses, that is performative in the context also of performance making, but also raises critical questions about what it means to create such a, de uh, a device and how it means to uh, uh, react to it in a real time uh, context. Yeah, thank you so much, Martina, for offering me this opportunity to present here. Um, I'm very happy to receive questions, of course, and to discuss further, like uh, with you all. Okay, thanks a lot, Diana, for for this um, for this uh, insights in your work uh, and these uh, ideas about um, embodiment or all senses embodiment uh, embodied knowledge and uh, bringing bringing it together with artificial intelligence. Uh, I would like to ask Mike Michael to give his presentation. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Martina, for uh, inviting me. Um, my name is Michael Strobig, and as uh, as Diana, I'm um, working with, uh, oh, that is the background, it doesn't work. I'm working with a vector um, <laughs> robot. Hello, vector, say hello. Um, my response to the topic of performance with AI comes from comes a little bit from my background. Um, I spent the last two years almost on a project called Regie KI, which is um, our, which was our attempt to create um, artificial intelligence to direct a theater play, also based on some um, some theoretical assumptions and also based on a model of a theater play that we, that we took from um, a theory of, of directing, um, but also um, from a background of um, a methodology that I, that I used and developed during my thesis, um, as you mentioned in, in Plymouth, uh, which is based on system theory and practice and kind of like a strange loop between, uh, between theory and practice, um, which is based on distinctions. And, and therefore, for me, uh, a topic like AI or performance with AI, um, uh, I always use distinctions to, to talk about these things. So for example, um, the distinction between AI performance and human performance, that, that would be one of the first um, that comes to mind. And that is often the, the one that is debated and discussed, like, uh, can the AI um, perform like a human or is the AI able to perform like a human? And um, this, is, this, is the, this is a very uh, big discussion and I think we're gonna touch upon that as well. But um, in my case, that's not the question I'm very much interested in. Um, so I'm using other distinctions, for example, um, the distinction between an AI performance and an AI non-performance uh, or, the, or the question, what would it mean uh, for the AI not to, not to be performative in, in, in any sense? So um, another distinction and, and which like um, connects to, to this one would then be performance in a, in a, in a technical sense, in a close sense, like um, what we saw from Diana's work um, when we talk about performance on, on a stage. Um, versus the performance in uh, everyday life that that uh, um, that accompanies communication, uh, for example, um, and this is an area that that I'm very much interested in because I think that's an area that has been neglected in, uh, within the artificial intelligence research um, from the beginning. And and my favorite my favorite example is when you take a when you take a book of computer linguistics, which is um, the, the science of how, how humans and machines should talk to each other, it's, 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 it's literally linguistics. Like the first 600 pages are about syntax, then comes 150 pages about semantics, and then comes 50 pages about what they call pragmatics, which is the actual commun communicative situation. And then in the appendix or in the last chapter, they say, oh, now let's talk about a situation where actually we have a human and a machine. Uh, and this is not a made up example, this is an actual uh, one of the leading textbooks in, in computer linguistics. And I think this is a big problem because you, in my opinion, you have to uh, put this 
uh, from the head from the head on 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 its feet, and you have to start with a situation. We have a machine, we have a human, and they start to communicate. What does that mean? What is that? And then later we come into the technicalities of syntax and 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 the stuff. But first we have to make sense of that situation. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, in my work, which is more artistic than um, academic, which uh, also has the reason that this kind of stuff is not getting the big grants because it's outside of the, at the, at the moment, at least at, of, of the um, uh, research program. So when I, when I talk about communication, I think about, or performativity in communication, I, I think about the work of Evan Goffman, um, who, who puts performativity from a, like a theater context into everyday life, describes it, but also Friedemann Schulz von Thun, who has a theory actually about communication that doesn't stop with like uh, information being ex exchanged like in computer science where communication is treated like a like an um, exchange of bits and bytes um, human communication has not only this um, this layer but also other layers like for example revealing of the self um, revealing of a sort of relationship between the sender and the receiver which is reciprocal and so on it's much more complicated than just exchanging um, information in a Shannon sense. So, and also the field of human rhetorics, which I think has been neglected uh, completely from the discussion. I mean, it's, it's an old topic since, since Aristotle and um, every politician know, learns rhetorics, but computer science um, people who study communication, machine communication don't know about it. Um, so um, just to sum up, it's um, for me, the, uh, the method is distinctions and to switch these distinctions and to walk through them and look for fields that have not been discussed so much in the, in the forefront and, and uh, yeah, contribute to, to that discussion. And I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to have a constructive discussion today. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Michael, for your um, short input and your position, clear positioning. And uh, so I, I would like to ask Corinna uh, to, to give her short input. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, very inspiring, um, already inspiring, um, uh, yeah, uh, exchange here. Um, well, um, my position is rather uh, from, uh, yeah, research. Um, what kind of research am I doing? I'm um, coming from uh, the field of uh, science and technology studies uh, um, and uh, gender studies, or we can also put it uh, as uh, feminist um, science and technology studies. Uh, that's um, uh, my main um, uh, perspective on this whole thing we are talking about uh, today. Um, I was interested in um, the question of um, how, how can we um, understand uh, gendering or, or gender race and other social categories, how, how do they um, um, come into the artifacts <laughs> and how do they uh, the artifacts produce again um, a social inequality so this is uh, my um, long um, standing aim of research for the i don't know maybe last uh, 10 12 uh, 20 <laughs> years depending on uh, where to um, yeah put the starting point and uh, I, st I started with um, computer science or starting with my first um, um, uh, what I learned in my studies mathematics <laughs> and um, computer science and uh, how how is uh, this all involved in the process of making differences in the world and making um, um, differences uh, that uh, we want to change if we look at it from the a critical stance and uh, um, the um, 
science and technology studies uh, perspectives gives me uh, several um, yeah, tools uh, such as um, the idea of how, how can we, um, one of the question here is um, not only the performative, uh, the, the, the question what is uh, performance performative, um, but also agency, I think, and which is uh, often uh, very, um, yeah, <laughs> we have different um, definitions. We have a lot of discussion about that um, often, uh, particularly if we uh, switch to the German language, if we uh, put it uh, like uh, agency is Handlung, um, uh, then uh, it is often positioned on the human side. And it's not, uh, um, for many people, it's hard to imagine uh, that uh, technology can have agency, but this is, I think, the starting point of um, many approaches in the science and technology studies to start with the agency of uh, artifacts or with the agency of um, the, yeah, interaction. there was already um, some uh, examples uh, of interactions between uh, humans and machines and I think um, this is a very um, yeah, um, fruitful <laughs> approach uh, to think uh, about uh, the whole um, question, um, the, the obvious um, questions here further. Um, my particularly, particular question for the last uh, few years is um, on AI, uh, the question of um, discrimination of uh, um, how gender, race, and other categories um, are performed or <laughs> acted out, or <laughs> however we want to put that. Um, uh, we came across that uh, example of uh, the Compass uh, system in the US uh, five years ago, I think about um, uh, that time uh, where we saw decision AI as a decision making uh, system uh, which uh, uh, was discriminating against um, Afro American uh, people and uh, in, in the um, uh, uh, court uh, with the system that that was used in uh, court uh, to predict. Um, whether uh, people who were already arrested uh, will become criminals in the future. So there is that uh, prediction idea in that. And I think that uh, was one of the first um, uh, big discussions uh, uh, we, were <laughs> um, we had on AI and on the uh, applications. Uh, another example was um, that uh, AI uh, recruiting, uh, recruitment software, um, which was uh, shown to um, discriminate against women. Um, uh, also, it was, uh, yeah, some uh, said that that, uh, that was the data <laughs> behind. Um, so we also have a long discussion about what is behind it, what is the question, the problem um, that uh, we have we are facing so many um, uh, so-called intelligent uh, systems uh, with AI uh, that um, are uh, reproducing or uh, even um, uh, f furthering um, uh, social inequalities and um, yeah um, we, we are um, uh, ha we have a lot of examples from border um, control, face, face recognition, and, and, and in medicine. And, and I think uh, now the literature is uh, full of uh, examples we know, but we are still struggling with the question of um, how to deal with that. <laughs> how can we uh, change and uh, um, yeah, somehow uh, get rid of that discrimination, social inequality by design? <laughs> um, of technology and uh, lots of um, computer scientists, for example, also work on this question in the direction of, uh, oh, we want to make more fair or transparent algorithms. Um, 
uh, which is, I think, a good idea and a good starting point, but uh, still not enough uh, because uh, we won't uh, yeah, uh, be able to get uh, uh, to fairer or socially just um, technologies in uh, this uh, on, on this track uh, because um, uh, in this uh, line of thinking often, and I follow <laughs> you, uh, Michael, in this uh, in your criticism, uh, often technologies are um, uh, considered as something that can be isolated. And uh, um, if I come back to that uh, view of agency uh, from uh, science and technology studies, um, uh, if I draw on that, um, technology is never technology as as, as such. It's, it's always um, <laughs> entangled uh, with. Uh, lot of um, other aspects. Um, for example, in the case of AI, I would say with, uh, sure, with data, with humans, we know, with methods, with algorithms, with, um, but also with discourse, with uh, bodies, as we have seen already in your examples. Um, uh, yeah, social structures that are important uh, from my point of view. Um, uh, imaginations uh, we have on uh, yeah what uh, also future predictions and and I think that all um, needs to be uh, considered in a um, respectful way <laughs> um, and uh, yeah I think we are still in the beginning um, uh, trying to approach that I think we have some theoretical tools from um, for example, um, uh, science and technology studies uh, to address uh, this. We have also some um, uh, new materialist approaches to address this uh, that I like to follow from a uh, uh, fe feminist um, uh, uh, perspective, but uh, still to bring that into the world, <laughs> there's a lot uh, to do. And I'm really happy to be here with you to uh, think about uh, this idea, how uh, we can make this happen. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Corinna, for, for your input, um, which gives a lot of questions. How can we find other forms of programming, finally, and how can we together with the arts, uh, perhaps, and performance? Okay, thanks. And uh, I would like to ask now Heidrun for her input. I don't know if you speak, I don't, we can't hear you. Yeah, thank you for inviting. Um, I would like to show one picture and then talk about the issue. Um, this picture is showing ambivalent creatures. It's um, work done by my PhD student, Elisabeth, uh, Elisa Dittbrenner. And those creatures are full of sensors and children are asked to uh, to create a life with those creatures and then to ask themselves how they want to deal with them or how they want to live with them. Um, I was asked to talk about performing AI and I will talk about AI and social systems. And my thesis would be that AI does not exist, but it only exists if we perform it. So, um, and I have two issues, the one is, technology and culture are not separated spheres. So Christiane Flois says, producing technology means to define a perspective onto culture. This is reductive as it does not cover everything. It does not cover every embodied, implicit or situative aspect. For example, culture, so knife and fork, is such a perspective onto eating. The perspective becomes a materialized operation. This is an example Christoph Richter, one of my colleagues made. So with software and AI, the perspective must be formalized so that the computer can understand and perform it. This form is materialized as soft in hardware and we sometimes neglect the hardware aspect of AI. And then it becomes auto-executed 
executable, auto operable. That means it's optimized. So the operation is optimized. It can be performed the same way a million times, and in doing so, it becomes performative in culture. To perform AI, this perspective on culture must be compatible and viable in culture. So if an IA is not somehow compatible to the culture, it wouldn't exist because we wouldn't perform it. So otherwise, we would not use it. AI would not be existent if we would not use it if it was not somehow compatible with our culture. So the question is, how is AI compatible and viable in our culture today? For example, why do we assume social processes are rationalizable? Why do we allow and desire future to be predictable and planable and secure? And why do we wish that future is producible as desired? With whom can we negotiate what future is desired and produced through AI? Which aspects of social life do we assume to be planable, desi designable, and feasible? And what, and what else is subsumed under to be designed, be designed in a rational way and to be calculated? A second aspect is what does software and what does AI? What is AI? Software is rule-based, rules and procedures are defined and executed through software. But what does AI? It comes in when rules are not known. If rules are not known, AI searches for regularity in huge amount of data. It treats regularities as rules and it traces our behavior based on activities which can be datafied, clicking, wiping, zooming, eye movement, pulse, and so on. And it align, aligns our behavior based on that. For example, students nowadays normally study seven semesters to finalize their BA. If you not do follow this regularity, you are flagged by the system. But where does this regularity in social life come from? Any social situations, situation is indeterminate and uncertain. So any social situation is uncertain. This is what Mark Bickert says. If there is two persons in a situation, the one does not know the status of the other. So the situation is uncertain and indeterminate. The two have to interact in order to define the situation as a specific one. So if you meet somebody and the other one says hello and you say, nice to meet you, you at the very same time define and co-produce the situation as a certain one, as a certain situation, as a meeting, not a combat, for example. So social practice is chaos, absolute chaos. But why do situations seem clear and determinate? Because we produce certainty through interacting with each other. So where does regularity in social life come from? We produce and perform regularity. And we do so through conventions, routines, and explicit rules. But they only exist as we perform them. They do not persist per se, but only as we perform them, create and recreate them. They are not prior to performance and social practice. They are only existent as we perform them, regelfolgen, as Wittgenstein said. But AI assumes rules and regularity as be prior to social practice and social performance. This is its mode. It must assume that. This is the utopia of rules, as David Kreva says. But we always can perform differently. So that's it. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot um, for your input. I'm looking for the standard. Okay. Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 thanks a lot, Heidun, for your uh, input. I have a lot of questions, <laughs> but um, I'm now in the role of the moderator. <clears throat> and I think. Um, um, yeah, the first round could be that you respond to each other. That's uh, what, what you, the ideas you got from, from
from this encounter between art and, and science, so to say. And for, for me, it's so very interesting that you, each of you has a, this, is this double background of the humanities and, uh, and computer science um, and uh, how you put it into your work. This is really super exciting. So as you like it to, to give response to your inputs. Yeah, I, I think we are a small round, so we can we can try to speak without uh, giving a sign. I would ask Corinna Bard, why do you think that difference is so important to us? So wh why is this an important issue in, in culture so that we reproduce it uh, with computers? Um, so discriminate in any how. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, computer science is, uh, is starting with this discrimination. I, I think also um, Michael was uh, um, putting an emphasis on uh, um, differences. Uh, you'd put an uh, emphasis on differences between <laughs> humans and machines or, or, um, or the question whether there are any. And I uh, think um, technology um, would give us the possibility to overcome certain social inequalities. If you um, yeah, really look at it from a very distant um, uh, view, um, but it doesn't. And in many, many cases, um, it is uh, rather reinforcing uh, social inequalities. Uh, although we would have the chance to, um, yeah, this is may maybe also a question here, <laughs> uh, whether it's easier to, to change um, <laughs> um, uh, the society or the technology, but um, that's um, um, what I'm um, always thinking about. Um, can we um, somehow um, overcome differences in this um, combination of, uh, yeah, uh, assembling humans and machines and data and everything else? Um, yeah. I don't know whether this really uh, gives you an answer. <laughs> you can continue if you want <laughs> asking. Um, if, if I might jump in, because there, there was there were difference and distinct. I just want to um, mention that distinctions is not difference. Um, distinctions is, uh, in my in my book, is the fundamental operation of how we how we observe and how we talk to each other. And without distinctions, we couldn't even talk or, or anything, there, there would be a, a thermodynamic uh, equilibrium where nothing uh, appears, no form appears. So it's, it's based on this idea, um, uh, yeah, this Spencer Brown and, and, and all this constructivist stuff, which I kind of um, rediscovered in Heidrun's, um, Heidrun's um, thesis that when, I think if, you're, if I got you right, you say we, we are constructing um, uh, communicative situations, we are constructing society, uh, we are performing it, and, and uh, there is no, no predetermined truth to it. So it's, it's always in flux, it's always like it's moving, um, in, in, it's moving in different directions that, that we want to shape that we want to be part of that that where it gets political like like what Corinna said about uh, how, how can we how can we prove things how can we make things better that's a political question um but it's always like moving and the question is can ais be constructed in a way that they that they are part of these social systems and that they don't come without um like pre-configured, predetermined, preset rules that that uh, used to be the old computational model. Um, and just to give one example from my own practice, when we when when we devised Regie KI, um, we used machine learning uh, to train on uh, our performers. Um, but the our approach was that we did not use a pre determined data, uh, like uh, pre-used data from uh, some of these very questionable data sets that come from computer science. Because as 
Corinna rightfully put out that, that there's a lot of like data that was just scrapped together without thinking, and and then there is uh, then there are biases and um, preassumptions in that set. So we decided that we would only train the AI in our performers. So our AI would also only recognize our performers. So it would not be the assumption or the approach that it's it's an AI that can talk to every and each human, but it's it's a very narrow, limited AI that can talk to the performance that it is trained on, and it's only trained on this humans and not on other humans. And I think when we when we start thinking that way, we can make some constructions in our uh, work that um, goes a different route than than has been has been in the past. So is it is this form of synthesis? synthetic data would would you use somehow because well someone performs in order to generate data which is then well which is then used to um as, assess the, the the future performance so it's basically it's training it's like a rehearsal situation it's training in the rehearsals and then later it should say this was a good performance or this was not so good performance in terms of the data that it learned before. But the data only comes from that specific person. It does not come from any model that we took from some computer science experiment or something like that. So that, that was our approach in that, in that um, kind of experiment that we did. Matt? May I ask a question on that? Uh, how did you um, decide uh, which performance is good or not so good? Uh, so, so what, uh, what uh, did you decide on what comes into the database and uh, what not, or what was uh, canceled? So I think that that's a, that is a very important um, question. So, and how did you do the, or arrange this process maybe? Um, the, yeah, the process was a bit difficult because we went, uh, we came into Corona and um, instead of like bringing the performers uh, into the theater and uh, practicing with them there, we had to, we had to build a device and send it to the performers and they were practicing at home. It was basically a camera, microphone um, to collect data from them. And um, the question, what is good or not, maybe the word good is, 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 um, is a loaded one in this. Um, but what the AI can do or should have been done was to measure a distance. And this distance is from the, from the rehearsals to the performance then that, that would take later on stage. So it can say you are, you are acting like you always do or you are acting differently. And this is a number, this is a value that an AI can compute. And then the performers have a choice that they, if they want to play along and if they want to make their optimal performance like they they should try to play as they always did or they could refuse that process and they could say i'm i'm acting against that so so this is like uh, in our in our conception there was like the freedom on on um, in 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 the process but um this question that you that you raised about normativity and about what is good what is a good performance was not there were questions that we had in mind that we want to raise, but not to answer, like in the sense of we, we built something that answered the question. But I have to mention that the project did not come on stage, uh, but we have a very nice documentary movie if you want to watch it. Um, there, there's a movie in the Schauspielhaus Düsseldorf website that can show more of this project. And what does an art-based approach, um, well, what, what can it do compared to a scientific approach? What, what can we, well, which knowledge can we gain through an art-based approach? Or what questions could we raise through an art-based approach? So actually I wanted to kind of like comment upon like what you've discussed so far and ask you similar uh, things. Um, like about the how how can we appropriate those tools basically how can we use AI not to um, um, 
to 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 challenge culture like uh, in relation to, to what you're saying uh hydron uh, earlier that uh, ai uh, the way it's built at the moment it's compatible with culture and it exists it, it exists because like it's interacting with culture um but also social systems are biased um and also like um how can we is is there any potential in there in which uh, AI could be actually beneficial to to debug societies, to debug culture? Does it kind of uh, uh, emphasize some uh, problems that we have? Uh, could that not that not be regarded as something positive about these technologies because it shows kind of like in a mirror like what what the problems are that we are confronted with, and if it does so, like um, yeah, I was wondering which are the strategies for. Um, appropriating this tool and use it uh, from uh, like a feminist perspective or like to use it to imbue it with values that we believe in, like to, to challenge the, the to, to, to imagine futures uh, in different ways. So yeah, that's also like what I wanted to ask uh, uh, Corina as well. Like uh, how how can uh, how can we appropriate these tools? Like how, in my opinion, artists are good with this. Like first of all, like uh, finding those breaking points and then creating very uh, experiential um, uh, experiential situation, uh, creating very emotionally engaging situation uh, in which those problems become like very uh, immediate. Like uh, they become very visible. Um, or in my approach. Um, Considering theater as a laboratory, um, I consider this like almost as a safe environment for practicing, for rehearsing situations, and then to find uh, strategies for uh, alternatives. Like how how can we change? Uh, what can we change? I think it, it's it's a process like um, of finding um, problems and finding alternatives and imaginative ways and also like emotional ways of interacting. Um, with these technologies, I was wondering from 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 also like from a more uh, research oriented perspective, also like um, what are the positive strategies like that we can adopt? What are the constructive ways in which we can appropriate those technologies? Yeah, I think I think these are the important uh, questions to to ask uh, currently, and um, also from a research <laughs> perspective, because um, we have a lot of um, methods in computer science um, that are already um, work in um, I, I would say traditional um, research uh, and development settings of uh, software. Um, but uh, with, uh, for example, um, uh, you, you were mentioning um, Heidrun, uh, but rather going in the direction of um, uh, participatory approaches. And um, I think there's a, a strong tradition that goes back to the Marxist um, uh, uh, ideas um, uh, of uh, strength, strengthening uh, workers uh, in the in 1980s or 90s. Um, um, and I think these um, strategies uh, still work, but um, I'm not sure whether this can work with uh, AI. Um, or it is at least a, a question because um, uh, you, you gave an example, um, Michael, uh, to, to, to do that uh, differently. And also you, um, uh, Diana, um, uh, you, Alina, you, you also um, uh, had uh, some ideas in mind to, to, to change that uh, by, um, for example, build uh, new um, environments or, or, or data uh, where you are performing or doing something differently in a way um, uh, that uh, we could consider maybe to be more just or more uh, whatever, <laughs> better. <laughs> um, we, um, and, and I think that's a good uh, direction uh, to go, but I'm not sure whether these uh, traditional methods um, that uh, were developed in computer science um, are able to do that uh, now. Maybe um, we uh, need to just bring these um, things here together that uh, you are um, developing and approaching. I, I think um, that's a very good idea uh, to go in this direction. And, and probably we can all only uh, start um, thinking 
who, who was um, talking about the situation in the present <laughs> um, from from now and 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 what we have uh, currently what kind of situation and um, maybe go a bit uh, further and um, I think probably our imaginaries are not um, revolutionizing <laughs> um, the situation. We can only start from here and, and trying to do a bit better. And uh, maybe from there on, we can continue and then it will hopefully go in a good direction. I'm not sure, but we still need, need that's my uh, personal um, I'm convinced that uh, um, we need methods if we go into computer science at least, but um, maybe you have different strategies. <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm too uh, narrow-minded uh, coming from um, yeah, uh, a certain um, yeah, scientific background. I would like to, to give in some nasty questions. <laughs> in a way, um, this is uh, not nasty, but uh, um, I thought, um, should we ask ourselves who is allowed to do programming? Who is allowed to become to, be, to become a computer scientist? Yeah, so must it be specific people who are um, not too rational, but who have uh, insight in uh, in the in the body, in uh, in embodiment, in situatedness, who can understand all the theories you mentioned coming from new materialism? Or feminist uh, like uh, Karen Barat, uh, um, her, her her notion of performativity, of interaction, all this uh, this this figure, the thinking figure of entanglement <clears throat> and the being together of human and non-human. <clears throat> so must we change the education of computer scientists and uh, only take specific people who may do it in order to fight against biases. And then I thought when, when Michael explained his um, example, how to translate it then, how to translate uh, all the theory you gave, which with, uh, from, from, um, from, the, from, the, from our contem contemporary discourse, we are changing our discourses to something like post-human, yeah, to entanglement uh, uh, thinking. Mm. But then we, we are confronted with, is, is this a bias or is it bad programmers? Uh, even if uh, Michael said uh, we, we try to change, not to take the given data. Um, but there was a question, can AI do it technically if, if AI is working with threshold and numbers in a way? It's looking, for, it can understand differences, differences and distances in the rehearsals you always did this now we are doing this so what what is the potential or do we need uh, to think about discourse analytic ai discourse analytic algorithms self -ref reflexive analysis uh, who, who can understand um uh, discourses and the negative aspects of discourse is this possible so this is um this not, not nasty, but but this um, how. But when Corinna and Heidung gave their inputs, I thought, yeah, great. But how to do it technically, and which persons do we need? And then finally, what we have now as a round, uh, we can bring Diana and Michael together with uh, with your students, or to make an institute for performing AI <laughs> in in all these double senses. I always think it's an entanglement of culture and, and technology. So I, I ask students of education to, to become creative in their ideas of what AI could do. And their ideas are always, in the beginning, are very narrow-minded. And then we, I say, come on, let's implement this at a, as a prototype and look what happens in, in a social situation. And things that, that happen in those social situations are always challenging. So once they, they I don't know whether you'd see that this is an, um, well, you, you can, your competences are tracked by this. And we found, and, and we used it in everyday life and it was so interesting what we found out about the social life um, when everything, every competence was tracked and things like that. So um, it's, it's not so that you must be a computer science. You must understand what AI does and then you can 
come up with ideas and test those ideas in order to find out about what social situations they co-produce. And this is so interesting. And then finally, students are so interested in what actually happened, not what they assumed will happen, but what actually happened in a social situation. And I think that everyone can learn that. And we have to practice this, um, well, inventing technology and inventing ideas to broaden what we think is possible. Yeah, if, if I can um, continue that, that thought, and I, I really like that approach of speculative design and, and uh, practical design. And I also think it's not so, uh, we have to acknowledge that there, there is a um, Arbeitsteilung. Yeah, we, we have a classical computer science field the people who are who are trying to improve on machine learning algorithms, um, it's a bit um, a far stretch to expect from them to also be social scientists and also uh, to, um, uh, yeah, pre pre uh, configure all, everything that they do in, in in societal terms. I mean, I, I remember we had um, Technikfolgenabschätzung, uh, the the uh, risk uh, assessment. Uh, um, lectures in, in our studies, but it was not like it was uh, it was um, a side study or it was it was not the main study. But we had it, and we had a, a very good professor who talked about these things, and and this is what what happens hopefully right now in the in the programs as well that the students get like um, that they they get. Uh, um, this sort of critical thinking perspective as well. But the problem is, and that you will always find is these disciplinary types that will say, okay, don't listen too much to that because it will, it will, um, it will be a bad thing for your career. And I, I, I know this kind of thinking uh, um, that, that some people think, okay, you have to focus really on, 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 on something and, and what can we do with that? We can, we can stay, uh, talking like communicating and staying in the dialogue of, about these things and and doing uh, um, uh, doing some experiments and the question be, that uh, I think I don't raised before like what what's um, or, or what's the difference between um, AI and let's say performative AI there is a there is an approach by Michael Matthias who uh, is is a game designer and uh, worked on on uh, uh, he he made something co-designed uh, uh, communication game called Facade. It's a classic in the, in the game studies and it was made with some, some AI at that time. Um, and he uh, put out the, the notion of expressive AI. And this comes very close to what, when we talk about performative things. And he said, expressive AI has to be, it has to be a different Forschungsprogramm. It has to be a different program of studies than the classical engineering AI, because expressive AI deals with that uh, communication with humans. It deals with playfulness, for example. Um, my my one of my research questions during my during my PhD was, can machines play? And this is an interesting question if you think about it, because uh, Turing's question in 1950s circa was, can machines think? Uh, and and uh, the answer that that has been given or or that many people believe now is that that, that that's a resounding yes. I mean, there were still people that are critical about this thing, but now the, for me, an interesting question would be: Can machines play, and what does it mean uh, um, for a machine to play? Um, and I, I don't give an answer because you would have to read my thesis, but. Um, one of the one of the directions that we go into is like to think about social systems like or uh, if if you want to naturize it um the assemblage of, of machines and, and humans uh, that, that we that we stop thinking about uh, ai as an individual phenomenon and this is a computer and this is a human but we think about the communication and the relations between these things and there lies an answer like what is play what is performative what is thing for me? It, it lies in that in that uh, social system, and and not in the in the artifact. And 
and, and, and in, the, in the object. And that's why I'm very critical about, um, pardon me, but some of these modern uh, um, materialist approaches like object-oriented ontology, I think that's the wrong direction completely because uh, um, the objects themselves are, are not interesting at all. What is interesting are the social systems that, that we, we use these objects. But yeah, I just want to throw in some controversial things as well. Yeah, and I wanted actually Michael to add to what you say that the social systems are very important, but I think also the the, the uh, creators of those systems or like people who uh, decide how to understand uh, performativity or how to understand play, how how play is going to be expressed or like um, um, designed uh, to to uh, be implemented in this device, because like um, even for example for the director AI where you designed your your own uh, data and your own system, you still have to take decisions from the very beginning like what sensors are we using like what what is my system gonna uh, understand about the world so the human cannot be taken out of the loop like it's the AI that we are designing it's always biased like it's always going through a filter of the humans who are involved in the pr process of making and then it's a matter of matching the the context of making with the context of using which which i think why hydron is doing is very interesting because like you you create this kind of playful experimentation with designing um, those devices and then you release them in the wild in a in a context that was not necessarily uh, yeah, predicted by by the, the the making or like there is kind of an unexpected uh, emergent quality um, of that, and I think those are important questions like who designs, uh, what decisions are taken for what context, um, and how is this process actually like transparent or visible through the performativity of 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 the artifact itself. I think this uh, this this notion of like a process uh, or, or what what Diana said it's uh, this relation between um, uh, making and using <laughs> yeah to to bring it in the social situation uh, and and the focus on communication is um, should could be a good way <laughs> to deal with it but but when when then we look to reality, reality in the sense of what is our daily life and uh, all this research also Corinna mentioned about um, this bias, this, this, uh, this awkward bias programming that people who are not uh, in a so-called biased white face um, with a, they are like standard, standards to be recognized by, by software. And there's a lot of research on this. Um, <laughs> Now we are still living with it and it had bad consequences in, in social life because then people are discriminated and segregated and all what is explained about police uh, predict po police uh, prediction and the social problems with, which come with it. This would be one, uh, what can we, can we do? Now we can perhaps teach students in another way in this more entangled uh, thinking figure and then future will be better hopefully. <laughs> Um, but um, we, we all know that there are big firms and politics behind all this. What can we go? Can we intervene? And the other question is um, still technology. There's like a, a Gotthard Günther this, uh, to have a more than binary logic. I, I'm not in, in mathematics, not at all, but uh, I, I read the concepts uh, from. Uh, uh, him and Heinz von Förster to, to have the non-trivial machine, nicht non-trivial machines. Um, have, have we also to focus on this to, to help techn to, to invent other technology? Sometimes people say we need other mathematics. Is it possible to have other mathematics under other logics? Maybe as a mathematician, I, I, I feel <laughs> challenged to ask, to, to answer on this. Um, uh, I was, I was um, 
thinking uh, through this question a, a lot uh, in my life and I'm not sure whether it, it is um, socially it's not possible to do <laughs> to have a different um, mathemati mathematics in the world because um, we grew up with that we can um, uh, if we um, look at the um, for example um, uh, yeah, uh, history of um, technology uh, we have uh, that uh, problem of um, uh, that we are always um, in a certain path and it's uh, really hard to um, change this um, kind of uh, path and it's probably the same with um, mathematics. Um, uh, but I agree that um, we have to think about that. We have to think about what um, mathematics or the, the binary, binary logic, um, which um, uh, is all yeah also in in ai very prominent i guess um uh, because of uh, that um um problem definition you know, usually as far as i uh, understand um uh, ai it's uh, usually questions of um <laughs> yes or no of um <laughs> is it in in uh, a certain um uh yeah, uh, uh, range or not, and um, the the real I would say from uh, uh, social and uh, humanities, uh, social science and humanities perspective, the, the real interesting questions. Um, those you can um, it's, it's still hard to um, address uh, these questions with uh, AI because uh, they. You, you need to already con configure the, the problem <laughs> in a different way. It's, it's uh, to my um, understanding as far, <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure, maybe you know a bit better <laughs> or <laughs> you, you <laughs> others, <laughs> um, but um, as far as I know, it's not possible to, to frame the questions that uh, we have in society. And if we uh, start with uh, the big question, for example, the crisis of uh, COVID uh, now, the uh, climate crisis and all, all these huge um, questions, challenges we have to deal with, um, uh, I don't know, we have to <laughs> really, um, put it very small to use AI and other technologies uh, as, yeah. Well, actually, I think uh, what Michael said, it's, it's a question from what data we use and uh, infrastructure is, of course, not easy to be changed, but uh, we can look at the net protocols. So the, the protocol protocols for the World Wide Web they allow to track the behavior of individuals and they could have been different. And it was, if you look at the archives, they really discussed and they decided that the behavior of individuals could be tracked. And that's an issue and we could do different. We could have different protocols in the World Wide Web. And for example, in education, so my field, um, um, we trace the behavior of individual students and individual learners, and we needn't do so. We could do different. We could trace um, the environment. For example, if I sit at this university, I could have a map where today there are people and, <laughs> and uh, where there's activity and where I could meet someone and things. So it could be data about the environment, not about the individual's behavior and it could be really different ideas really really different ideas but it's also of course somehow hardwired in in the protocols of what we can do and what information we get or what information we are not allowed to get so it's it's very deeply into the infrastructure of course and that was decided on it it was not just um, nature or things, but it was designed. And that's so interesting that design is always somehow um, relates to the culture. So if we have a culture where individual behavior seems to be so important, <laughs> we have different protocols than if we have a culture where, well, tracing the environment, environment would be more important. So, so one response that that I um, my, is my favorite response at the moment, like thinking about things, for example, like AI and theater, and 
um, that that goes back to what Diana said about um, the humans behind. Um, a bit provocative. Uh, let's not talk about AI and bias and AI and problems, but let's talk about the people who are actually responsible for that. And because I, in my view, it's a little bit um, a distraction, like to say, this is a bad algorithm or this is a bad data set and so on and so on and so on. There's somebody deciding to deploy that data set. There's somebody saying, we use this algorithm. We buy this algorithm from this company. There's somebody saying, we fund this project or that project. And, and, and I think by, by, pointing and and there's a lot of pointing like oh this ai it's dangerous it will eat us all and uh in the in the silicon valley um version of it the the the, the singularity i think singularity is bullshit to be honest um it's a it's a distraction like from our own responsibility like we are the ones that have the power um and if we decide to give the power to or, or to give the decision making to an AI, like in financial systems, where like selling and buying of uh, micro transactions, of fi financial transactions is outsourced to machines, that is somebody's decision, right? And this, this should be our point of like always look at the human, like trace it back to the human. And that's not only the, the people who, who made the AI or programmed the AI, but the people who decide to deploy the AI. Um, and and that, that's my favorite like answer at the moment when people talk about the, uh, this, this possible dangers or uh, problems that don't look at the machine, look at the humans. I totally agree with that. And I also think the pipeline of AI is like quite complex and like it has so many stages uh, in which the human comes in the loop to create meaning, to take decisions to, and in different configurations. Like for example, it's not only the sensors and the data acquisition, but it's also the data labeling process. Like we, we have like a lot of research at the Institute upon uh, meaning making like in the date by data labelers who are also like um, uh, in the context of uh, uh, social systems that um, uh, manifest power over them. So like it's it's a very complex um, uh, system of creating meanings um, uh, where there are many people in the loop uh, and the decisions are not always fully transparent. So I think kind of revealing the, the full human ecosystem behind the hood of uh, the AI making process, it's very, very important and having this kind of self-reflection uh, of the humans involved like what are those uh who are those people and in what relationship of power are to each other and how they are creating these taxonomies because it actually like those um yeah the the taxonomies in which they they kind of separate the the world and then propagate further um power and biases and so on yeah i would like to bring in um uh, um this to this important idea about who is responsible who is doing it and who is working who is obeying in a way to it uh, I, I want to put in a, like a media uh, research and media historical idea because um in digital cultures or in post digitality which name we want to take it may be the same topic um we are in in agencies yeah, if we make a med medical operation we with Da Vinci system, we have to operate together. We have to anticipate and adapt both each other. So this notion of <clears throat> AI being a partner <clears throat> is very concrete and very real uh, and very um, working in our bodies in, in the case of med medicine. So may it be that <clears throat> these ideas that we have now, if, if I come also from a Foucauldian idea of uh, there are necessities in, 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 in societies and technological conditions, that we need to change the idea of the human and the idea of the relation of human and technology, that we come up with this thinking figure of entanglement and agency and assemblage in a moment where we really need it, because uh, technology is so... <laughs> 
everywhere and ubiquitous and and uh, we are in an entanglement with, with them this is a like a, a fact and then if we go to on the technological side I, i'm i'm referring to the research of klaus pias who is a media scholar at lüneburg in the center for digital cultures working on simulation and um he had this idea about um the simulation programs in the 1960s about pandemic because we had this topic of Corona, of COVID. Um, so there had been a lot, like, like they tried to implement and to design social systems. Now, I don't know exactly about the technical side of the simulation software and technology to, to design and to, 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 to make predictions about social groups, who is with whom, who's going where. Um, so so um, may it be that we are, we, we are already we have already a history of this um, entanglement and agency, software and technology and mathematics. I don't know what is mathem mathematically behind this. We have to study this, but maybe that, that there's also that um, also Latour, this was one uh, thesis and idea from uh, by Klaus Pierce. Latour is like um, um, bringing up uh, in, a, in, 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 in a social theory, um, this idea of this technology or this, this technology, this, this conditions of this technology. So this is one of my questions. Um, are we coming up with entanglement in the moment where we are already entangled? And this is our condition of life. And then um, um, yeah, um, yeah, this is this would be like like my question: Are, are we uh, supporting technology with looking for better ideas for better futures? <laughs> and, and I, I like this idea of so. Uh, 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 Martin, I sorry for interrupting. Yeah, and then, uh, then um, I'm always very alarmed, <laughs> alarm clocks in my head. If uh, if we come, what we could take, all the data we could take, there's Sandy Pentland and, at MIT, and he's so in love with all data and uh, <laughs> taking from emotion, taking from affective people in the space. Uh, and then he says, and then we know each other better. And then I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who will use this data and uh, who will know better and what we are creating for, for doing for, for better futures and more equal futures and being better better together as human beings more in, in social context and entangled and so on uh, aren't we uh, working for more surveillance or more um yeah, giving more and more information and data to ai and if she's she she it is it is doing things we can't understand anymore this could be also frightening and dangerous um if i can say something is like um i like this idea of simulation and uh, um, practicing things in safe environments before they are released into into the wild and i think there is a great potential there like um if we use technology like um in, in a safe way, uh, I think technology can be very promising in many ways. I don't see only the negative aspects, but I see also the positive aspects, such as like, for example, we can see ourselves better, like we can see biases, we can see, uh, we can identify patterns, we can increase transparency in processes that were not so transparent before, like inequalities have been always there, but now are becoming even more uh, visible just because we have those technologies to, to prove them. But of course, it's a dangerous tool because it's um, propagating power and it's accumulating power uh, only in the, the hands of the few. And I think that's the danger of it. And I think it's also, um, uh, it's neglecting certain knowledges and certain pools of knowledge that we had before technology was developed. And I think maybe like a, a way of looking at it is also like looking at the values that stay like in those technologies from the very beginning and what do you want to create with them. And uh, I'm thinking about also like indigenous practices and like um, um, pools of knowledge and uh, that have been neglected in our modern societies. And if we could somehow like um, bring concepts like 
technology that we imagine as kind of hard and sciencey and uh, uh, very limited imaginations of these technologies, can we expand those, those imagination to include, to be more inclusive, to include wisdom that we forget, that we have forgotten, or to include the values and perspectives that we don't see? Well, I, I think the question of could we come up with a better world? This is always a question citizens should negotiate in a democratic way. And it's not something that entrepreneurs should do by inventing technology. Um, I'm just studying, um, well, the, the development of the internet as a political and social um, well, process. And there is an idea there from, let's say, more or less Silicon Valley, which is that we have no, no citizens anymore, but we have only entrepreneurs who invent technology and make the world better with technology. And this is so striking because there is no democracy and there is no states, but there's just entrepreneurs in this new world. I'm a, and I'm very critical about that. Well, well, I, I would say we couldn't say there is no citizens, but there are entrepreneurs only. Of course, there are entrepreneurs, but they should always be citizens, and we should always, in a democratic manner. Um, think about what is a better future. We should not just say those who can come up with some technology are those who decide on what is a better world. And of course, we need different imaginaries. And this is why I think it's so important to have arts in this um, process to come up with ideas we couldn't find words for. So there's arts first and then they come words to describe what what we have seen or what what was performed and i think it, this must be a democratic issue or a, well, well i i think so because well there, there are very striking developments in the web or in in the web development i i, I would like to respond to that um Heidrun. Because on the one hand, I, I see a point, and it's it's especially a very also European perspective. I think we have another, uh, we we have a certain historically we we, we got a certain um, view on like how democracies should be run, like how how states should be run, and uh, social security systems, and so on and so on, which is a bit different if you are in uh, Miami or in. Um, other places in the world, um, Singapore or uh, Nairobi or, or whatever. Um, and I think some, some of the stuff that's happening right now is coming from the perspective that at the moment we have a very unhealthy concentration of, uh, um, of power in the web or in the, uh, which is also uh, comes, comes back to the problems of, of algorithms that are deployed by um, companies like Facebook or now Meta. Um, which try, which have, uh, which have grabbed a lot of like a concentration of power in that in that sense that they they own the algorithms. Uh, lo a lot of it is closed source. A lot of it is uh, hidden. We don't know what they are doing, but we know now more and more thanks to research uh, of the like social science research and, and critical AI research, we know more and more what's happening behind the scenes or what the, what the effects are. And so one of the ideas of the so-called Web 3.0 uh, uh, you know, into a different future is that, that we should own uh, and this, this is, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a controversial thing, but it has to do with like build our own economies. And I think, um, uh, we, we've seen some attempts to build local economies, for example. We, we uh, like to um, uh, build local currencies and this kind of stuff. We see some artistic uh, explorations into money um, and, and so on and so on and so on. And I think I'm all for it. I'm, I'm saying let's, let's experiment with this stuff because it can't go on like this, like it is in the moment where two or three or five big corporations get bigger and bigger and bigger and get more power and more power and more power. And this has something to do with, with also the economical system. It's not 
just the political system of citizenship. I think it's also economical system, but that's just my, um, my hunch on that. It seems that Heidrun has, a, has an answer or questions to this. And then I, I, I would propose that we come like to a last round, like a resume sum up uh, to finish. But Heidrun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there, there is a, um, at the moment, uh, we look very often onto those um, very big platforms. And beyond this, there is a development towards decentralization and the Web3 tweeted. Oh, but um, there are some right winged movements there. So I'm not, I'm, well, it, it's very difficult to, to, to look into this um, because, uh, well, even decentralization is not always um, a development for more um, equal, equal, what is it in English, sorry. <laughs> There's new inequalities there. So I'm, I'm a bit into that. So I'm, I'm skeptical about um, what is coming up somehow. Yeah, so. Yeah. I'm, oh. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also quite uh, skeptical. Um, I, um, as, so you said you, you asked us to, to um, conclude or um, uh, give uh, last comments and um, uh, in the last round um, of discussion, my um, I heard uh, that we gave uh, the um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah the, the, the um, uh, for, for on the responsibility and accountability back to the humans, to the programmers, to the people who decide on um, uh, uh, who uh, which kind of. Um, uh, um, uh, infrastructure is built, um, or um, even to the companies, and we come to the more um, <laughs> bigger problem of uh, economics. Um, and I, I would agree uh, completely, but uh, still, I think there is um, uh, another part uh, that we still have to keep in mind and uh, in focus of analysis of uh, a critical intervention, which is also technology. And this uh, uh, goes together and comes together. And it's not, uh, not only about deciding and uh, what kind of um, questions I, I'm asking. It's also about um, uh, what is uh, possible to do with uh, certain technologies. And um, what I see with AI is um, that um, you will know, have that uh, stati statistical um, um, take on uh, the, the data. And uh, this is always something uh, which leaves our, yeah, so the, the um, at the edges, <laughs> Uh, people or whatever data, uh, which is uh, not um, the average, uh, is not um, considered anymore. So um, I see that problem also that we have uh, technology that um, uh, goes in a certain direction and that uh, leaves out uh, some people behind uh, that are not uh, um, following the norm uh, that cannot follow maybe the norm or the normativity and uh, these norms are different in different countries and different cultures, uh, sure. Um, but I see this uh, problem and um, so we have, <laughs> I think technology is not, not out and we still have to um, uh, follow this um, line of thinking of um, how um, this uh, goes together in assemblages or however we want to uh, put it with that, uh, with what kind of theory, but uh, we cannot only look at the humans in these issues. Okay, this is like the first final statement what I propose to do now. So if you like, 
to do a short, uh, short sum up. So in my opinion, I think that many problems that we have with AI today um, are not only technical problems, but are mainly human uh, problems uh, and society problems. And before starting big at world scale and trying to debug societies and trying to de debug culture, I would start with small scale experiments, um, uh, trying to define very small contexts of usage and uh, uh, seeing how um, and trying to understand what te this technology does in very small assemblages, like with one or like a, a limited number of people that um, and this is what I'm trying to do with Replica and with the, the shape of things to come to experiment to have this kind of embodied interaction, real time interaction with AI uh, in very small assemblages uh, in which we can debug and explore um, in a safe environment problems that might appear, that might emerge, um, experience how we feel, how we communicate, how we construct, how we make, and how we take decisions together. Because this is also like um, before inventing utopia, like we try to negotiate like in a small group, the process of decision making. And I think this is also something that theater is very good with because this kind of negotiation between the margins and the center, like who gets to speak and who gets to uh, listen or like how to uh, be participatory and how to include different voices, how to co-device performative piece together or like, so it starts with this kind of human process of nego negotiation, like the decision making. And I, I, I have to say that it has been challenging, like even with a small group of nine people has been very, very challenging. So I think at a wider scale, I can imagine like this, this is very, very complex. But um, this is how I try to, to approach some of those topics at the moment. I, I like this idea of very local practices and local uh, implementations. I think this could be a very challenging and, and um, promising approach. And probably this is what, what Michael also had in mind when he said there's local currencies or community-based currencies. Um, and probably I, I just look at other developments. So I think I trust in, in those idea of, of um, local practices and local um, developments um, and to, to not just find the alternative to the existence to the existent but just well broadening what is already there and and finding some alternatives which make what is thinkable a bit wider so to say <laughs> Um, I just read an interesting um, article on performance in AI by a certain Martina Licker in this uh, wonderful book, Algorithmen des Theaters, which I can recommend to everyone. And in, in this uh, article, Martina um, traced the, like a historical and critical view on the performance in AI. And I, I think she, she kind of critically um, concluded that the modern or some of the modern performances with AI are a bit trivializing. Um, so in, in that sense, I take it as a, as we say, an Auftrag or um, an order by Martina to, to uh, dig a bit deeper and to do a bit more and to work um, um, on the artistic side of these projects. Like, like um, we said before, there is the uh, computer science side, there's a sociological side that, that uh, observes the computer science side and there's the artistical side that does something completely different and maybe interferes with all the other things. So in this sense, I feel, um, how, how, how should I say it? I feel energized and um, um, yeah, poked by Martina a little bit to, to go further. Um, and and uh, for me, that's, that's a good thing. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> I think I will stay a bit the critical eye, but uh, with a lot of love and um, energy. <laughs> and uh, as um, uh, Kai Vogel said in another talk of our series, in another conversation with Klaus Piers, let's 
let us, the artists and, and the scientists and the scholars, the researchers, I will say, take it and experiment and uh, take it over, even if you can't, but don't give up. <laughs> in this. And I want to thank you very, very much um, that we um, that we met. Uh, for me, it was a very uh, deep and uh, and multi plural um, um, discussion, um, and I'm I'm really happy about it. And I hope that our listeners will see it in this way and take a lot of 